Well, hello, everyone. My name is Todd Latz. I'm a CEO of the Brampton Board of Trade. Welcome to the Brampton Board of Trade's Business Insights uh, Series. This uh, topic today is uh, the major transportation and transit projects that are um, uh, happening in uh, Brampton. It's a very exciting uh, decade of development uh, ahead and we've got uh, some panelists that I'll introduce formally in a moment uh, to walk us uh, through some of the, the, the top five uh, transit and transportation infrastructure projects uh, which are contained in uh, the Brampton Board of Trade's 2023 uh, transportation overview. We'll put the links uh, in the uh, uh, chat to that uh, document, but as is tradition with uh, the Brampton Board of Trade, we like to pay acknowledgement to those that have uh, come before us. Uh, we uh, do operate on the treaty lands uh, and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, but for about a thousand well, actually, I should say thousands of years, Indigenous people, uh, Indigenous peoples inhabited and cared for this land and continue to do so uh, today. In particular, we acknowledge the territory of the Anishinaabek, the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Ojibwe Chippewa peoples, and the land that is home to uh, the Métis, and most recently, the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, uh, who are direct descendants of the Mississaugas of uh, the Credit. We're grateful for the opportunity to work on this land, and by doing so, we give our respect to the first inhabitants. I'm, enjoy, I'm joined today by four business leaders to uh, discuss uh, these major infrastructure projects, transit transportation infrastructure projects. Joining uh, me today is uh, Shauna McMillan. She is a member of the 2022 Government of Canada's Supply Chain Task Force and one of the authors uh, of the ACT report, Action, Collaboration and Transformation. Also with us uh, today is Chris Drew. Chris is an urban planner, member of the Brampton Board of Trade, strong transit uh, advocate. Welcome, Chris. And uh, Ron Bauhaus uh, is a small business owner and, and an owner, a graphic designer of new uh, and owner of Newark Creative and a, a train transit uh, aficionado. I'm so happy that each of you are able to uh, join us. We are anticipating that uh, Joe Jackman uh, yes, Joe Jackman has uh, arrived as well. Fantastic. Joe is an important member of uh, Brampton's manufacturing uh, sector. He's a director on the Brampton Board of Trade and president of Almeg Aluminum. So thank you, panelists. Really appreciate you being here today to uh, uh, do a high level overview of these major projects, what's in the transportation overview. It's always a pleasure to speak uh, with each of you about your perspectives on how these projects will make Brampton the very best it can, uh, can be. So um, why don't I start then? I guess I, I've mentioned the five uh, projects. I should probably list them. The five that we're going to cover today are um, the Hazel McCallion LRT uh, line or the Hazel line, the Main Street LRT extension, which uh, I understand uh, will go to Brampton Council in the, the very near future, a format uh, decision on their part, Queen Street Bus Rapid uh, Transit, which is moving to uh, preliminary uh, design or preliminary design is underway. And uh, the expanded Kitchener uh, Go uh, train service, two-way all-day go. And, uh, of course, the GTA West Corridor, sometimes also known as Highway 413. Um, why don't we uh, put that slide up, uh, Justina, uh, just to demonstrate uh, what we call the decade of development. There are so many uh, uh, good projects that are happening. We, uh, for the benefit of our members here at the Brampton Board of Trade, we have over 1,900 uh, business owners and corporate representatives that uh, employ over 61,000 uh, here in Brampton. We put this timeline together to help them in their investment making decisions, in their hiring decisions to uh, better understand uh, when improvements are occurring in highways, transit, transportation, downtown, et cetera. And as you can see from the many bullet points on uh, the uh, uh, horizon there, it is a very exciting time uh, for Brampton. So let's get right into the first uh, project that uh, then, and that is the GTA West uh, Quarter. We can go to the next uh, slide. This is an outline of uh, the proposed 52 kilometer highway and, and transit way, transit corridor that spans York region in the east at uh, Highway 400 um, through the top of 
uh, Brampton, just south of the Brampton Caledon uh, border, then dips uh, down further into Brampton through the Heritage Heights. Uh, area and meets up with uh, the 401-407 uh, interchange. So yeah, that goes from the 400 uh, in the east to the 401-407 interchange uh, in uh, the west. It's been much politicized uh, prior to uh, the uh, uh, last provincial election in particular, but the re-election of the uh, provincial government remains means that the project remains on track for construction uh, to begin. Uh, we can estimate perhaps uh, sometime this uh, decade, we'll talk a little bit more about what our expectations can be. But with Brampton and the GTA continuing to grow, one of the fastest growing uh, populations, jurisdictions in North America, it remains an important infrastructure priority for businesses in Brampton and, uh, and growth for our broader region. So let's go to uh, the first uh, question. Uh, and I'm gonna pose this to Joe, uh, from a practical sense, being the owner of a manufacturing and a, a, a large employer uh, here in Brampton, and, and Shauna, of course, uh, with her uh, expertise in supply chain. In practical terms, how will this quarter, how will this highway help businesses grow? Who'd like to start? Go ahead, Shauna. All right, I'll, I was waiting sure. to see who took us off <laughs> mute first. <laughs> um, I'm going to jump in here and just tag on something, Todd, that you mentioned. Uh, Brampton is one of the fastest growing areas in North America, has been for a while, and we don't see that slowing down anytime soon. So when we talk about in practical terms, what is that highway going to allow? It's going to allow for more people movement and goods movement. And both of which, if we're going to increase the density of people in a particular area, are absolutely required. I don't think, regardless of the economic situation we may be in now, and I know there's still debates about whether we're in the recession or not, and I'm not going to get into that, <laughs> but there is demand out there. There is consumer demand, there is business demand, and with that business demand comes the ability to grow, but you need the infrastructure to support it. And that, I think, practically is the number one thing that that highway will bring. People movement, I, I know we've talked in the past, uh, you can't build anything without the people to do it. I know our machines and, and our AI and everything else are doing great, uh, but we do have a lot of people resources we need to move around. And those people require things and the things they require also need to move. And, and so I think practically speaking, that's the number one thing that this corridor will bring. Right. Well, thank you for that. And Joe, um, you might have a perspective as well. I, I know we had uh, talked earlier about phenomena you uh, saw during the last uh, couple of years of some of your loyal employees uh, deciding to move uh, outside of Brampton to other right. locales and uh, the importance uh, for them to have a choice. Did you want to elaborate on that? Sure. Yeah. A lot of them were priced uh, out of the market, whether they wanted to buy a home or, or rent. So a lot of them have moved further uh, up north, up to Alliston, Barrie, uh, uh, Aurora, Newmarket. And so their commute in is, uh, is significantly uh, longer than it was when they lived in Brampton. Uh, we've also onboarded a lot of new employees uh, in the past uh, year or so. And again, a lot of them are coming from further away. They just can't afford to, to live here or they, they want the benefits of living, uh, living further north of the city. So um, we're, we're a 24 seven operation. Um, so we have, um, we have people coming in, uh, you know, at five in the morning. So public transit isn't always the best to be able to, to get here. Um, so yeah, the 413 extension will be very helpful in them getting here um, uh, in a more timely fashion, not just the 5 a.m. people, but the people that are coming in at, uh, at 5 p.m. And, and, uh, and, and that are going home at 5 p.m. So um, yeah, it'll be very uh, helpful, as Shauna says, for people and goods. Uh, we also see a lot of um, suppliers that are that are moving further north. Uh, rent rent rates for uh, industrial has gone up significantly uh, in the GTA. So we have some suppliers that are moving up to Barrie, up to um, uh, Alliston, up to Newmarket as well. And so our trucks uh, need to get up there to drop off material and, and bring it back. And so the 413 will be hugely helpful in us getting there in a timely fashion and getting back so we can get on to the next, uh, the next delivery. Right. Well, thank you for that perspective, both from a, a people um, uh, imperative, uh, an employee imperative, but also, as you uh, so well articulated, a supplier uh, perspective as uh, well. And just on that point, I mean, uh, our viewers may not know that the you know eastern terminus 
of the proposed highway is near the CN's McMillan uh, yard, a major intermodal uh, terminal. And um, uh, the western uh, terminus uh, is not that far from the uh, uh, currently being uh, constructed uh, Milton Logistics uh, Hub. Uh, Shauna, did you want to uh, talk a little bit about the, what those two facilities are and uh, how uh, this highway might uh, uh, be uh, essential uh, for um, the, uh, the movement of goods between the, those facilities as well? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and one thing I did want to touch on, just based on some of Joe's comments, uh, the connectivity of the 413 to the other 400 series highways is incredibly important. So in theory, the 413 goes uh, east-west, sort of, um, as you can tell from the picture, not exactly. Um, but in, in uh, GTHA terms, it's east-west. <laughs> but it does need to connect north-south. And, and to Joe's point, there are things north of the city um, that currently are not as accessible as they need to be. So just, again, for the audience, pointing out those connection points. Um, but yes, from an old employer of mine, CN, they have uh, massive facilities all the way along this 413, as well as their uh, direct competitor also in Vaughan have, have facilities that are directly on these highways. And really the important message is things that travel by train don't necessarily get to people's back doors by train. Mm -hmm. um, it, the infrastructure in Canada and in North America for rail grew up a long time ago um, when there wasn't the dense populations that we had. And uh, there were things that were right next to rail yards. But uh, the Macmillan Yard, which is a combination of automotive products, so the cars you buy at a dealership, um, general merchandise, which is forest products, lumber, um, could be metals, um, but it also has an intermodal yard uh, attached to it. And what intermodal is, is, is boxes, those colorful boxes you see on all the trains traveling across the country and across North America. Well, those boxes don't just magically get to a warehouse or a distribution center. They do have to get from that rail yard to a distribution center, to a warehouse, and then get out to all of those store shelves so that we can buy them all uh, either by Instacart or going to the bricks and mortar. <laughs> um, and, and really how that happens is by truck. And yeah. so the more arteries you have access to as a transportation service provider, like a railroad, to be able to get that product cycled as fast as possible out to the suppliers that need it to build those parts that go into the manufactured items, um, the manufactured items that have to be assembled, all of those things. The, the faster you can turn that around, the easier it is to grow, the easier it is for customers to buy. And that's really what brings the 413 to light is the connectivity to the other 400 series highways and the key terminals that are along that 413 that will allow that product and people movement to happen quickly. Well, that's uh, those are very important points. And one of the points you made uh, was the north-south connection as well. And I'll just point out to viewers uh, that there is intended uh, to be, um, uh, you can see at Highway 410 and Highway uh, 427 connections north-south to the highway as well, really uh, uh, providing lots of options uh, for commuters and uh, uh, those that are moving uh, goods, manufacturers, exporters, uh, because we know that uh, at any given time, 401, 407, there may be volume backups, there may be accidents, uh, and uh, it's uh, very nice to have a choice. Uh, I'm going to go on to the second question about the other features of the uh, corridor. Chris, did you uh, want to make a quick uh, comment on the 413? Yeah, just, just really quickly, Todd, um, just where you see the 427 and that dotted line, just to give a shout out to the other uh, National Railway in Canada, there's also a CP Rail major intermodal facility uh, in Vaughan. So in addition to the McMillan Yard, the Brampton Intermodal Terminal, and the future uh, Milton uh, Intermodal Terminal terminal for CN, uh, there's also an enhanced connection here for the CP Rail Vaughan Intermodal Yard. So I just wanted to make that point. And, and maybe you'll get to in the next question, so I don't want to pre-lead you, um, Todd, but um, I think in part of the discussion about the GTA West, and it is fairly early in the design, there's been some discussion about if if bus rapid transit lanes could be uh, incorporated. But I don't know if you're going to mention that in your next yeah. question. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you for that segue, Chris, uh, because uh, a lot of people don't uh, know uh, that the GTA West Corridor is not just a highway. Uh, it, it certainly is uh, and will be one of North America's most intelligent transit systems as a highway, but it also includes uh, a, a transit way uh, component and other important uh, infrastructure uh, 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 
uh, Shauna, did you want to, or, or Joe, did you want to, well, maybe I'll go to Joe on uh, on this one. Uh, Joe, what are some of the other features of the corridor that make it much more than, uh, than a highway? Um, so one of the things I, I like that the, it's, there's an extension of the 410 that will go up to it. So that should help, you know, unload some of the traffic, uh, at least further up the, the highway, which will be, um, which will, which will be helpful. And again, uh, to Shauna's point order, just all the feeder um, extensions that will, will allow, and we don't want to get into the housing conversations that are going on, but we need more housing. I don't think anyone will, will de this debate that we need more housing. Where's it going to go? Where are people going to go and how are we going to get them, you know, to and from, uh, work. Um, when it comes to the uh, potential transit lane that's on there, I mean, again, it'll only be helpful and that we know that's that's a, a bit of a wild card uh, if or when that will happen. Um, but we need to put some infrastructure in place and get it going. Uh, Brampton um, has delayed on a lot of uh, public transit things. You'll get into that other questions, I'm sure, but we need to make some decisions and get rolling on uh, on some of these things. So it'll be, it's good to get this conversation going and um, and uh, and just go from there. Yeah, well, thanks, Joe, for that uh, perspective. And I know that you've uh, you, you're a, a, a 24 seven uh, uh, shop as well. You've got yeah. people coming in at all hours. And um, hydro, the reliability of hydro is important as well. And this corridor uh, will also be a, a hydro corridor, a transit way, a highway, and uh, yeah. all of uh, uh, that infrastructure is just um, absolutely essential because of the speed of growth uh, of this uh, section of uh, the GTA and this section, uh, 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 this really unique uh, uh, region uh, in uh, in North America, um, uh, and uh, I don't know. I think we've covered all the various features. It's going to be an intelligent uh, transportation uh, system. There will be uh, electric vehicle uh, uh, charging stations uh, along it, uh, carpooling lanes, etc. Um, what, why don't we get to the last question before we move on to our, our next topic? When might we see the highway operational? I see you're all uh, looking at your. Do, do we ball. get to decide that one, Todd? Yeah, I was going to say, can we give an answer? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there are a lot of regulatory uh, uh, hurdles. Uh, the province uh, has uh, moved to an expedited uh, environmental assessment. The province uh, is uh, also uh, acquiring uh, land. Um, the federal government has uh, designated the highway uh, for uh, potential review and additional. Uh, for for review, but uh, uh, that means uh, potentially an additional environmental assessment, a federal one on top of a provincial one. If that is to occur, uh, we can look at a delay of at least uh, five years. Certainly the business community has been uh, quite adamant that environmental assessments need to do what they are intended to do, and that is to protect the environment, not to be a conduit, a vessel for every anti-highway and uh, uh, anti-development uh, opportunity to put barriers in the way. So uh, the province and the uh, feds are talking right now about whether or not this needs a separate uh, federal uh, EA. Uh, and if that occurs, uh, you can add five years to the time horizon. If, if we take a look at the longest uh, term before it gets uh, uh, shovels in the ground. Of course, funding uh, is so important. There hasn't been any money allocated uh, for uh, construction yet, still planning, environmental assessments. But uh, you've got a couple of uh, election cycles in there as uh, as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, possibly by 2030, we might see uh, shovels uh, in the ground for that uh, project. Okay, we're going to move along uh, quickly to the uh, next uh, um, uh, transportation issue, and that is, again, regional connectivity. Thank you for uh, this slide, uh, Justina. What we see here is a topographic uh, of uh, downtown uh, Brampton. You see that uh, long horizontal line there. That is uh, what is referred to as the, the Kitchener line. You can see uh, an arrow indicating where Brampton GO station is. Uh, uh, just uh, intersecting with that rail line uh, south of it, uh, you can see uh, Queen Street and uh, the intended uh, Queen uh, BRT. But before we get to the Queen BRT, let's uh, talk about um, enhanced service along this uh, Kitchener line, the business community along Canada's Innovation Corridor. Now that's from Waterloo Region to downtown Toronto with Brampton right in the center. They have made seven day, all day, two way go service 
along the Kitchener line in advocacy, and it certainly has been one of the strongest advocacy points of the Brampton Board of Trade in the last uh, uh, 10 uh, years as well. Currently, most of Brampton does not have the same connectivity to downtown Toronto that uh, most of the region does, perhaps, you know, on the Lakeshore line, for example, Bur Burlington and Oakville. Due to an issue related to track ownership along uh, a particular stretch of the rail corridor, this is a significant barrier to growth. So my first question is uh, to, to Ron, uh, uh, Ron or Shauna, what's the simplest explanation for the reason that 2A all day go isn't achievable right now? Ron, did you want to handle that? Um, well, I think the simplest way to describe it is that uh, it's, an, it's an issue of ownership of the track. Um, between Toronto Union Station and Kitchener, we can essentially divide that corridor up into three sections. Uh, from Toronto Union Station to Bramalee is owned by Metrolinx. From Bramalee through to uh, the west end of Georgetown is owned by CN. And from, from Georgetown to Kitchener is owned by Metrolinx again. So this all important section in the center, uh, in the center as far as Bramptonians are concerned, is owned by CN. Which, and that is what CN refers to as its Halton subdivision. It's a, an extremely important uh, corridor because it serves Macmillan Yard, it serves the Brampton Intermodal Terminal, and it serves the upcoming Milton Logistics Hub. It's also uh, a major thoroughfare between uh, Toronto and uh, points in uh, New York Strait, New York State, uh, Michigan, Chicago. Um, CN is essentially a T-shaped uh, network, and uh, this is an important part of that network. So there's a lot of uh, freight traffic that travels along that corridor. We also have a couple of VIA trains every day, and then we have uh, the multitude of GO trains that are trying to snake their way through. And essentially the issue for GO is that uh, this segment of track between Bramley and Georgetown, it's almost like a I would describe it like a street intersection where you have two intersecting roads and you've got a very busy road, which is CN, and then you've got a lesser traveled road, which is the one that GO and VIA use. And the GO and VIA trains are trying to hop over uh, CN to get to the other end. So um, obviously they're at the at the mercy of you know uh, the agreement that go has with uh, cn as far as yeah. how many trains they can push through that intersection per hour yeah well it's really competing objectives from a consumer's point of view uh, we want goods we want uh, food in our grocery stores and drugs in our pharmacies and clothes on uh, our retailers uh, shelves but we also want to be able to get have options to get into uh, work if we work in the uh, neighboring city for example and you know just to put a finer point on it the, uh, you may, you really articulated that well in terms of an intersection uh, with two competing objectives goods movement and commuter traffic you, you know any given day you could see 20 CN freight trains, and they can be, you know, up to two mile long, uh, plus 29 GO trains, plus two VIA trains. That is a lot of traffic, uh, you know, right in downtown Brampton. Uh, Sean, I don't know if you have anything further to add to, to that, or, or maybe we could go to the, the second question with what are the options to fix this, and how do they compare in terms of cost and technical feasibility timeline to implement? implement to Shauna? Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think Ron did a great uh, job trying to explain the issue. Um, really, you've got um, perception of a single train track, train line that goes from point A to point B. And the problem is not everybody owns the, the same pieces of the track and not everybody maintains the same pieces of the track and not everybody has the same ideas about what volume should be on that track. Um, and, and that really is the crux of the problem. Um, you have to get everybody to a table and try and figure this out. Um, Todd, I think you brought up probably the biggest issue that we're going to have with that corridor is um, for CN, it really connects Central Canada to Western Canada and Central Canada to the US. So for them, any disruption in service on that line disrupts their entire North American network. So think about that from a manufacturing perspective, if you've got an assembly line in your plant, if you've got, you know, people trying to get to work on that graveyard shift and can't get there, things don't happen the way they're supposed to happen. And that hiccup then takes sometimes very long times to recover from. And so when you're thinking about this from, from CN's perspective, they're like, look, 
we'd love to move more people. We'd love to move more freight. We'd love to get more money for that. It's a revenue perspective. Of course, they want to try and do all of those things. But on the flip side, they're thinking of, oh my gosh, it's a traffic jam already. I already have too many trains going a day that I'm already dissatisfying probably people that I shouldn't be. How do we make the two meet? And I think, Todd, the solutions then become what I call issues of boiling the ocean. So nobody wants a train going through their backyard anymore. If anybody followed all of the uh, Milton Logistics Hub, uh, 10 years worth of press on that one, um, as much as we want the goods and we want the services and we want the jobs for the people that work in the area, we still don't want trains going through our backyard. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, you've got one single train track to put all of these people on instead of perhaps acquiring additional lands, creating another option um, in the same locations. Some of these locations are pretty far flung. So there's still some land out there. Don't, don't get me wrong, Canada, yes, real estate prices are going up, but where in, in industrial land is concerned, there is still some available. Um, so that is an option. But Todd, to your point about what's feasible, when you talk about acquiring land, when you talk about then uh, creating that land feasible for trains, that's when you see the price tags uh, start rolling up. And so that's why this has been such a contentious issue. I think Todd, you mentioned over 10 years, the BBOT has been advocating for this amongst many other groups. There's a reason why they haven't come to a solution yet. They haven't found one that fits all of the pieces where it's affordable for all the parties involved. It's feasible to move both people and freight and that neither get interrupted. Um, and that, that really is just where we've come to. Um, there is solutions out there. Yeah, there are. and Ron, um, maybe yeah, maybe yeah. you want to elaborate on that, uh, Ron. Uh, I've got uh, Justina's just uh, thank you, thank you, Justina has uh, put together on the the right hand side the graphic of uh, what we're talking about from uh, uh, well, I guess all the way to St. Mary's in London uh, to, uh, to to downtown Toronto, uh, the Kitchener uh, line. Uh, but Ron, uh, on the left hand side of the graphic, there uh, some solutions with respect to how that rail line can be better shared uh, for both goods movement commuters. Can you elaborate on that for a bit? Sure. Um, uh, I should note that uh, these diagrams are uh, essentially derived from a Metrolinx document from uh, March of 2021, where they talked about three possible solutions. Uh, one was essentially a uh, business as usual state of good repair solution, where essentially they don't build any new track and they just do what they can to achieve incremental improvements. So uh, the first option that's shown in the diagram uh, shows essentially what happens today, which is that uh, GO trains coming in from Kitchener uh, stop at the north on the north side of the CN line at Georgetown, at the Georgetown GO station. And then they cross over uh, CN, they cross over to the south side to get into the uh, either of the two platforms, south platforms at Mount Pleasant and to the platform at uh, Brampton Go. But what happens there is that when trains make that crossing over CN is that it blocks the route for CN freight traffic. Um, whether the freight traffic is coming eastbound or going westbound, it, it has to stop so that the Go trains can cross over. And the agreement that Metrolinx has with CN allows them to only cross over once per hour. So that's where, um, you know, the idea that you can't increase the frequency beyond one train per hour comes from, that they have this agreement. So uh, that's what the first option illustrates. And it essentially means that you can't really grow the service beyond what we have right now, uh, at least not... Uh, west of Bramley, uh, because east of Bramley, Metrolinx owns the track and they can essentially do what they want. Uh, the second option is uh, what they call an at-grade crossing in Georgetown. And uh, the very clever folks at Metrolinx devised a plan where they could increase service to Kitchener, to and from Kitchener, by having essentially two opposing trains meet at Georgetown and they would both cross CN at the same time. So they wouldn't um, negate their agreement with CN where they can only cross once per hour, essentially by having both trains cross over at the same time. 
It means that at Georgetown, they would have platforms on both the north and south side of CN. Uh, so the train coming from Kitchener, for instance, would stop at the south side and the train coming from Brampton would stop on the north side. Um, you can increase service a little bit uh, west of Mount Pleasant, et cetera, by doing this because you can now bring in uh, east and westbound trains west of Georgetown. But even if you add more tracks between uh, Bramley and Georgetown, you still have that underlying issue that whenever a GO train is crossing sides, the freight traffic has to stop. So you can't increase, unless GO negotiates a new agreement with CN, which I personally think is doubtful. Um, is that you're still gonna be limited to one crossing per hour. So you're yeah. never going to get the service increased as much as you'd like. Yeah, yeah. And then the third option is the more expensive one. Go ahead. Yeah, well, that's that's the gold plated option where um, they essentially have what they call a rail over rail grade separation. So essentially what you do is if we go back to the uh, road intersection concept that I mentioned at first is instead of having to cross um, at the same level as CN traffic, you either put the GO line over it or under it. So essentially a GO train can cross over without impacting CN traffic in any way. And if that crossover, if that um, bridge or underpass is at least two tracks wide, you can have east and westbound GO trains crossing over CN simultaneously and it won't affect CN traffic at all. I think, one thing that needs to be mentioned here, and you know, I think we need to be sympathetic to CN on this, is that uh, CN runs a lot of traffic through there. In the transportation overview, we talked about 20 freight trains a day, but that can fluctuate. Sometimes it can be very, very busy on this line. And once the Milton Logistics Hub opens, we don't really know how much traffic there's going to be. And uh, having this option available to us would allow them to increase their volume of traffic without uh, you know yeah. any concerns. Yeah, I, I think you make a good point uh, there as well. And both CN and Metrolinx have worked well together uh, in the last uh, eight years. We have seen uh, increased number of trains uh, from uh, Kitchener-Waterloo uh, into Brampton and uh, uh, to um, Union Station and uh, an increased uh, uh, frequency uh, as uh, well, faster uh, trains as, uh, as well. So it's great to see uh, the cooperation. Uh, there is uh, double tracking occurring uh, uh, at, uh, at Georgetown. And uh, um, I guess that leads us to our, our last question. And that is, um, when uh, will we see, from the business community wants to know, when will we see uh, seven day, all day, two way, uh, go. Um, thoughts on that? Again, cons uh, consult your Ouija boards. Uh, your, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Actually, in I... the, in, in, sorry, Sean, I'll, no, uh, just, uh, in the Metrolinx document, they say that they see this process taking uh, 66 months. So five and a half years, uh, I guess from, you know, whenever the green light is given. Uh, it should be noted that uh, the rail over raid grade separation would require an EA, which has not been done, but that would be carried out by CN apparently. Right. So that, and there that, also is the issue of cost, of course, as well. So. Yeah. And that 66 months that you're referring to is for option three. That would be the, uh, the rail grade. Yeah. So. But, you know, it, for anybody who's ever renovated their kitchen, we always know that these things take longer than we expect. So, you know. <laughs> Okay. They, they take longer and more money usually. Yes. Um, but just just the one thing I, I did want to point out, Ron did a great job going through all of the different options. As you can probably tell, the more you get with your options, the more money it's going to cost. And in rail infrastructure, different than road infrastructure, road infrastructure is entirely funded by the different levels of government. Rail infrastructure, when you're talking about companies like CN, which is a going concern on, on two stock exchanges, you do have to take costs into account. It is not entirely funded um, the way road infrastructure is. And so we're talking about a shared asset that somebody owns, that somebody has to maintain, that somebody has to do something with. Um, the dollars and cents do make up a big part of it. So um, 66 months sounds great <laughs> for an infrastructure project uh, that would be this impactful. 
Uh, I think there's a lot of good discussions that are going to happen between now and then about how to best manage it. And other than option one, which was do nothing, um, there is a lot of land construction infrastructure that needs to, to go into whatever variation of the theme we end up with. Yeah, and one thing I would add is that, uh, again, in this Metrolinx document, uh, I'm just looking at the page that talks about the economic case and uh, the difference in cost between uh, the between options two and option three is looks like, to my uneducated mind, looks like about you know, 200, 250 million uh, difference. So, uh, you know, well, I mean, in terms of uh, future flexibility, um, you know, what this could mean for uh, bringing, you know, workers to Brampton, bringing talent to Brampton. I think, you know, the thing about Go is that it has traditionally been looked at as a Toronto centric service. And, uh, you know, in terms of uh, students coming to university or workers coming to work in Brampton, we need to look at, uh, you know, the traffic, how an expanded or enhanced system would work as far as uh, making Brampton more of a destination in itself. Yeah, good point, uh, Ron. And uh, it may not be uh, uh, 15 minute service all along um, the Kitchener line, but uh, uh, having frequent enough service between Guelph and Brampton, for example, Kitchener and Brampton can really help a lot of employers here in our region. Well, thank you for explaining that. We're gonna move on to the, uh, the next, uh, 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 infrastructure project, and that's the uh, Queen uh, BRT. I am just going to hold up for the camera. We're referring, and it's in your chat, uh, the online link to the Brampton Board of Trades uh, transportation overview. You can see these diagrams. You can see a more uh, fulsome uh, description of uh, the projects. Um, why don't we uh, get right to the Queen Street BRT? Uh, Joe, you're on the east uh, end of town. Chris, uh, I know that uh, you've been following this project and an advocate for this project. The Queen Street, of course, is a key artery that serves dense employment and commercial uh, areas and uh, offers uh, connectivity uh, to the broader region, connecting all the way from Mississauga Road in Brampton uh, in the west through, <clears throat> excuse me, through downtown uh, right into uh, Vaughan, right into uh, Highway 7 and uh, Weston Road. Metrolinx in the uh, city have identified getting rapid service along King Queen Street uh, a priority, and it's now studying this 24-kilometer corridor uh, between Brampton and Vaughan. Chris, what are the main benefits of bus rapid transit BRT along Queen Street in particular? Thanks for the question, Todd. I'm a strong supporter of this project. And before I begin, I just want to give a shout out to uh, some of our participants we have here because I can see the participant list. So we have city staff here. We have folks from the 407. Uh, we have folks from uh, industry. So welcome to all the attendees uh, and folks from economic development uh, from city staff. So welcome uh, to all of you. So this is a very exciting project. And the number one benefit uh, of it is faster travel times for transit riders, period, full stop. Because this project, and it's the Queen Street Highway 7 bus rapid transit project, because it does extend into Vaughan. So this is a dual municipal project, which is very exciting, gives transit riders more certainty, dedicated space, uh, consistency in terms of their travel time. And it means that the buses won't be trapped behind massive congestion. We know Brampton's growing. We know it's a huge logistics hub. We know the Brampton Intermodal Terminal is a key uh, hub. And the challenge along this corridor is that the buses are trapped in congestion. And we know that this is a problem because of the rapid growth, thanks to staff, of Brampton Transit. Brampton Transit is at 160% above where they were pre-COVID, above where they were pre-COVID. Go Transit, the TTC, are really struggling to get to 100%. Brampton Transit is at 160%. And it's obvious from the map, the number of north-south routes that this spine connects to. So the benefits for transit riders, which benefits employers because transit riders are employees, are better travel times, more consistency, faster service, uh, a better overall customer experience. And for the operator, the city uh, of both Mississauga, sorry, of both Vaughan and Brampton, it also helps with operating costs because it means that you can better project out how many bus drivers are you going to need? Is the bus going to arrive on time? Fuel savings. 
The list goes on and on, and I won't go into all of the numbers, but there's a very comprehensive initial business case that Metrolinx has done in partnership with the city, and the numbers speak for themselves. So if folks are, who are participants want any of those detailed links, they are in the transportation overview, uh, and there's been a recent uh, public consultation meeting, and that deck is available online. So many benefits, and I'll stop myself there. That's great, Chris. And uh, they're looking at uh, a couple of different options at this stage. Uh, they're uh, in preliminary design. Can you maybe elaborate on what some of the key differences are on where the bus rapid, where the buses would actually uh, go along the road center line versus uh, perhaps you could explain? So fundamentally, the existing condition um, is it's generally a six lane road or a two lane road, depending on what segment you're in or in some cases, a one lane road, uh, one, one car uh, or truck lane each direction in, in downtown Brampton. It's a very diverse corridor based on segments, going right from the west of Mississauga Road all the way to Islington and Weston Road. You have downtown Brampton, you have a Bramalee portion, you have uh, two major overpasses over the 410 and 427. So there's a number of different city segments. Center, yep. City, city, city center, a key hub. So there's a number of different segments where they're looking at different options. So one option might be you remove an existing car lane and you make it a bus rapid transit lane. So it's exclusive to buses. And another option might be you expand the right of way, you preserve the same number of car lanes and you add in the bus rapid transit lane. And it's we're at the very initial stages as Metrolinx has pointed out. They will get to 30% design approximately next spring where they will have a final recommendation after looking through uh, comprehensive data and meetings and meeting with city staff who again are participants in today's call or today's Zoom. So we don't know yet. They've very helpfully laid out the different segments and the different options they're looking at. And I know it's something that the business community in Brampton will be looking at closely because in some, in some locations, maybe near Airport Road or the 427, uh, there might be some argument for having a wider corridor and keeping the number of car lanes, but in downtown Brampton, a more urban setting where you're trying to encourage more development that's pedestrian oriented, in that case, it might be better to remove one of the car lanes, preserve some of that capital um, to give um, to give the buses exclusive uh, use. And in downtown Brampton and around the city center, there's at least three or four different ways they can kind of get in and out. Um, graphically, it's too complex to put on this screen. But again, that public information, that, that presentation rather is publicly available. They're at the very initial stages. So if there are businesses, employers, transit riders who are very interested in about this, they can contact us at the Brampton Board of Trade. We can put you in touch with city and Metrolink staff. We can provide links and there's more meetings coming up. So more to come, but it's not going to be a one size fits all as far as what we can tell right now from Metrolinks. It's going to be very detailed design, very detailed analysis, segment by segment, block by block. If um, the preliminary design, this is the question that we ask after each of these uh, infrastructure projects. So when might we uh, see it? If we uh, have just started preliminary design to 30% and then it wouldn't have to go after uh, a decision decisions made there to 100%, then funded, et cetera. What's a, a reasonable time frame that we might see Queen Street uh, Highway 7 bus rapid transit? Well, it's it's really hard to say. Um, and I would say that we should be really in some ways cautious about, we should strongly advocate for as soon as possible. And we should press governments at all levels to fund it and get shovels in the ground. But we also want them to be uh, sensitive and careful. Just as an example, uh, the Ottawa LRT, uh, as people know, there have been some challenges. There are 100 recommendations from that uh, project, and many of them are excellent and can help other projects in terms of procurement, early works, geotechnical, detailed design. So I hesitate about wishing for a specific date, 2028, 2030, because I want them to take a sensible amount of time to get the design right, to get the procurement right, to get the procurement model with the construction companies right. It shouldn't be just a bumper sticker for a campaign slogan to say X date and Y amount of dollars. It really should be a thoughtful, detailed exercise with excellent collaboration between Metrolinx and city staff, which I'm very optimistic, excellent communication, uh, between politicians. And partly it, it comes down to funding. And when the design is ready and they have a recommended approach, well, quite frankly, the MPPs and the MPs need to get their act together and sign that funding deal and get the cash moving as quickly as possible. Yeah. And, so and Metrolinx can do their job and they will do their job. 
and they can be experts and professionals, but it also takes political will and courage to get the checks out the door as quickly as possible. And that was a challenge identified in Ottawa. And that's been a challenge identified in other transit projects where all the studies are done, but there's political wrangling. So there needs to be a fire lit under these folks, figuratively speaking, to say, get it done. The business community wants it. Transit riders need it. Let's go. So I'm not going to answer your question on a specific date. It's as soon as possible. BRT yeah. has been used around North America, around the world. There is no reason this project can't be implemented smartly as soon as possible, but it requires political will. Chris, you make a very good uh, point. Uh, many times in government, uh, we see uh, the steps, as, as you say, that are necessary, the uh, detailed steps to make the right decisions, but we see them um, occurring sequentially, where in business, where time is money, uh, there are always opportunities looking for process improvements to um, uh, concurrently or uh, not sequentially uh, make decisions. And to your point on uh, funding doesn't have to uh, occur at the end, it can occur uh, at, at the beginning or any stage of, uh, of development is one that's uh, really, uh, uh, I hope our elected officials and certainly will continue to uh, send that message to them. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're we're uh, on to the last uh, of our five projects that we're highlighting in the transportation overview. And that is the Hazel McCallion line and the Main Street LRT uh, extension as well. Now you might say, well, oh, my business is not uh, downtown. Why should I really care? Well, what's really interesting about the extension of uh, well, both the Hazel line and the extension uh, uh, to Brampton Go is that it will allow um, a reallocation of buses east-west that will greatly quantum leap uh, the uh, service of bus east-west, as well as providing a very reliable and fast uh, rail line north-south. So just to give some historical background, in 2015, the City of Brampton Council rejected. The City of Council uh, in Brampton rejected 100% uh, capital funding. Uh, and so we've got a uh, line that's going from Port Credit from the lake uh, to uh, Steeles in uh, Brampton, but only to Steeles, to the south side right uh, now. Um, it's, uh, we hope that uh, Brampton City Council, who will see uh, a, a format uh, report, um, two formats have gone to 30% design, we hope that City Council will make a decision quickly uh, and move forward uh, on uh, one of two alignments, uh, a uh, completely surface or a surface with a tunneled portion in the downtown. So uh, to Ron and uh, Chris, and uh, by all means, our other guests uh, chime in. I know, uh, Joe, uh, you can anticipate seeing much better uh, bus service once <clears throat> the rail line uh, is, uh, the LRT extension is in Brampton. but. Um, uh, Ron or Chris, what are some of the most relevant considerations in this surface versus tunnel alignment options that uh, Council will see uh, sometime this month, sometime in the coming month? Ron, did you want to start maybe? Um, well, I, I just thought I'd start perhaps with uh, just talking about where the Hazel McCallion line project is now, just so that uh, anybody who's not aware might be uh, brought up to date. And that is that over the past two, three years, uh, a great deal of work has been done along here Ontario Street uh, in terms of uh, early works, in terms of uh, all of the utilities that need to be either relocated or new utilities added. Um, also in Brampton, we have uh, the maintenance and storage facility for the uh, train sets that will be running up and down the line. Uh, that structure, which is uh, east of here Ontario Street and just south of the 407. Uh, the construction is uh, largely complete. Um, it will be able to house a great number of uh, train sets there and uh, uh, you know whatever happens in Brampton uh, at least that we've got that part of the uh, facility. Um, and uh, you know they're the construction is moving up towards uh, to Steels. Um, I'm not going to get into the uh, the issue of where the steel stop is. Uh, one hopes that if Brampton does uh, uh, manage to get the extension built, that there will be some sort of accommodation built on the north side to uh, make it simpler for passengers to detrain or end train uh, north of Steeles. Um, as far as the two op 
uh, alignment options go. Um, from my perspective, it's important to note that they are not uh, identical options. Uh, the surface alignment includes uh, an additional stop at either Queen or Wellington, depending on which direction uh, you are headed. Uh, there is a 1.7 kilometer distance between uh, the Nanwood stop and Brampton Go. And uh, uh, that's a significant distance. Uh, on the Hazel McCallion line, there was a residence group, I think it, I, I'd have to look it up, but I think they're called the Earnscliff group that were concerned about a gap between two stations on that segment that was 1.25 kilometers. And they wanted to stop uh, within that segment. Uh, so that's a little bit of a concern because it, I think with the tunnel alignment, it assumes that all of the traffic is going to come and go from the Brampton GO station or the transit hub. And uh, there is no consideration given to people who would like to access the service between there and Nanwood, uh, be it Gage Park or City Hall. So that, that's an important uh, distinction between the two options. Um, as far as uh, other differences between them, uh, certainly the tunnel option uh, allows for faster transit times, which my understanding that the, uh, the public information center, uh, that was uh, very important to a lot of the uh, people who chimed in with their opinions about the project. Uh, that it be as fast as possible. Um, I think that's that's mainly it. Uh, you know, there are other considerations in terms of uh, for downtown merchants as far as visibility goes, and as far as uh, also extendability north towards Mayfield. Uh, the tunnel option would require that uh, if an extension is built at some day, that uh, it will require additional tunneling, which would be likely more expensive than uh, extending at surface. Um, additional considerations just given uh, recent events in Toronto with the transit system is uh, security for underground stations. Uh, you know, uh, in the past year, uh, GO Transit has locked the doors to the underground tunnels at the Brampton GO station um, due to uh, what I believe are security concerns. So I'm wondering if the city has a plan as far as that goes in terms of uh, protecting uh, users who are, would be using the, an underground station uh, in the off hours. And uh, have... just, we just uh, spoke about the importance of the Queen BRT as well. Um, any uh, concerns there with respect to connectivity uh, uh, with the Queen uh, BRT between either of these two options? You want to go, Ron, or do you want me to comment? Uh, go ahead, Chris. Well, I'm going to say bluntly no, and I'll tell you why. Because it's premature, given that there's three or four different routes of how Queen BRT will actually get into downtown Brampton, which streets, to at this point uh, be too concerned about what final decision might be made, because that analysis is still happening. So the transfer distance or time to get from a surface or tunnel option uh, between LRT and BRT, it's it's premature at this time because we don't have that final report for Queen BRT. And any day now, and I know there's city staff on this Zoom, we are actually going to see where the city is at in terms of 30% design for tunnel and surface. Uh, we had to get our transportation overview out. We didn't know the exact timing of these 30, this crucial 30% design report. Uh, we look forward to reading it. And so that will really help provide uh, more information. Th the reality is that sometimes in complex projects, um, it does take a little bit of extra time to get between two modes. And I'll just give you an example of the Ontario line. The Ontario line being built through downtown Toronto, tunneled, is being required to be built quite deep to avoid uh, the complexity of the existing subway system. This was a lesson learned from cro for the Crosstown LRT. So the reality is sometimes, unfortunately, in transit, maybe the transfer of distance or elevation is a little longer than it should be uh, ideally. But with elevators and fast escalators, as they've done in Crossrail in the UK, there's mitigation that is possible. But I think from, from my perspective, from my personal perspective, I'm not worried at this point because I want more information. And I also just want to give a, a shout out to Alstrom um, because Ron touched on it, the Mason search the maintenance and storage facilities. So the light rail vehicles that will be on the Hazel McCallion 
uh, and the Finch West LRT are made in Brampton, which is very, very exciting. That's a lot of jobs. So we're very blessed as a community to make cars and light rail vehicles. That's really exciting. I, I could go on in terms of the differences between surface and tunnel. Uh, I will just be brief and say that we definitely anticipate that, um, that further report. Uh, if businesses in Brampton are interested in getting involved in this discussion, they can contact Todd, they can contact city staff, there will be public meetings, there'll be opportunities for written deputations and in-person deputations. So there's lots of ways to get involved in this LRT conversation and the pros and cons. And city staff are looking at several different criteria uh, for tunnel and surface. It's everything from transit travel time to civic events, pedestrian conditions, access impacts, utility conflicts, property requirements, value for money, total cost. So a lot of this material is summarized in our transportation um, overview. And a lot of the background uh, information from city staff is on the city's uh, website. But I just want to give folks a heads up that we'll get fresh information 2023, 30% design information very shortly. And the reason why that 30% threshold from an engineering perspective is so essential is it brings a better certainty in terms of cost. So for example, just by comparison, the Queen BRT, it won't get to 30% design until next year, 2023, which is fine. They're both studies are ongoing, but very soon we'll get an updated capital cost, whatever that number might be from city staff who are working hard on crunching the numbers and looking at different factors. And Joe uh, spoke earlier in the call about employees trying to find a place to live and talent. And it should be noted that this is a very complex situation in downtown Brampton with existing utilities, a very dense urban core, and five or more active development applications in downtown Brampton. And in speaking to some of the developers that I have or a potential for a Rogers campus, there is a keen interest in downtown Brampton. And one key difference, Todd mentioned the 2015 discussion, the two words that I hear always, every day, both in my job and in my personal life and among friends that I didn't hear in 2015, two words, housing crisis. We are absolutely in a housing crisis where people in my generation and my younger brother, who's a chef, cannot afford to buy or rent in Brampton. But there's five active development applications in downtown Brampton and the potential for more, including with flood mitigation money that's in place and mitigation is happening. That's also something we didn't have in 2015. So there's a lot of considerations for tunnel or surface. And part of it is looking at the complete picture. It's very complex and we need to thoroughly review that report that's coming. And I would certainly urge city staff to proactively meet with Todd and us and the team. So my plea to city staff who I know are on the call is before that council meeting where this is going to be reviewed, please reach out to us. We would love to meet with you and do a page by page turn. So there's no misunderstanding. We know exactly what the report says. And it's not, and I should know, this isn't just city staff in terms of transit that are involved. There's economic development staff that are involved in this conversation and government relations staff that are involved in this conversation because the government relations staff at the city help council meet with the MPPs and meet with the Brampton MPs in terms of the funding component. And obviously the funding component is also complex and is gonna be of key interest. And so this 30% design report is going to have the most updated data. And again, there's a great opportunity for collaboration among all the key stakeholders, business, transit riders, the Business Improvement Association, residents in downtown Brampton and up and down the line. And just as a quick analogy of why this corridor, which is a made in Brampton route because it's in the Brampton official plan. It's not just a Metrolinx route. It's a made in Brampton route based on the official plan for a very long time. This isn't just about people in downtown Brampton leaving Brampton and going to work in Mississauga. Think about the opportunities if you have more office jobs, mixed use, hotel space in downtown Brampton, and people can connect to the here in Ontario now, Hazel McCallion LRT. You could also have someone who lives in Kitchener take the GO train in, get on the LRT on Main Street, and maybe works at Shoppers World or the reverse. There's so many different combinations. So although we're only talking about three kilometers of this stretch, look at the key interchange with the Queen BRT and obviously GO, and then look at the growth potential for office and residential in downtown Brampton. So this isn't a case of people leaving downtown Brampton on the LRT or the BRT. This is also about the opportunity to attract people into downtown Brampton to work. Maybe they live in a condo near Union Station. They hop on the GO train. They get on that LRT. 
and they connect to um again yeah. shoppers world or they go north and and we should also talk about the the north portion of Brampton, which is rapidly growing in terms of residential. So that's why this corridor and Queen, I really think of them as two, as, as one line rather than two. They're, they're not in competition. It's about building a network in Brampton and it really enhancing that network effect. Well, thank you very much uh, for that uh, passionate articulation, uh, uh, Chris, and you're absolutely right. And we have wonderful working relationships with uh, our uh, city counterparts, and uh, we do look forward uh, to uh, that review once the uh, uh, once the uh, report is uh, released, uh, I'll give uh, a last go around to anyone. Uh, Joe, I know um, uh, many in Brampton think that, well, if we're not downtown, uh, you're located in the, the east, that, you know, a lot of these uh, transit projects may not be uh, relevant, but uh, um, maybe uh, uh, you could um, uh, give us some final remarks on what you heard today and uh, uh, any advice that you might have for uh, governments moving forward. Yeah, I think it was a great discussion uh, all around. I think, uh, yeah, we have just over about 125 employees that take public transit, one of the various transits around. Um, I'd say any, any, this whole discussion was great, but anything that's going to help get our employees to and from work safely, quickly, and consistently, we need all three of those, um, uh, gets a big vote from me. And so, you know, let's just get rolling on these things. Fantastic. Thanks so much, uh, Joe. Uh, well, thank you to all our panelists. Uh, if there aren't any other uh, final remarks, uh, it is the top of the hour. I just want to let uh, folks uh, know. Uh, I just want to thank our panelists, uh, Joe Jackman, president of uh, Almeg Aluminum, Ron Bauhaus, uh, small business owner of uh, New Work uh, Creative, uh, Shauna McMillan, a uh, member of uh, Government of Canada's uh, uh, task Force on Supply Chain, and uh, uh, as well, Chris Drew, a uh, transit advocate and uh, uh, strong uh, volunteer, urban planner and strong volunteer uh, here on the Brampton Board of Trade. Uh, thank uh, panelists for this uh, overview. Uh, uh, viewers can read more of our transportation overview online at bramptonbot.com. You can see the link in the chat. Upcoming uh, meetings, of course, we have International Women's Day coming up. Inspire Her is going to be an amazing evening event. That's on March 1st. On March 15th, please join us for our Federal Issues Forum, where we'll have an opportunity to talk about the importance of federal funding for these transit and transportation infrastructure projects. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, I thank you very much for your attention here today. And uh, we always uh, look forward to seeing you uh, either on screen or in person at the next Brampton Board of Trade event. Thank you very much. Bye now. Thank you.